Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for November 20th, 2020. And we all know here that supporters of the monster state love citing the Commerce Clause as justification for a federal power over virtually anything and everything. But over the summer, I did an episode covering four main Supreme Court opinions that expanded the power of commerce, the power over commerce from its original legal constitutional meaning and gave support for that monster state of today. And on this episode, I want to go back in time a little bit to Chief Justice John Marshall's 1824 opinion in the case of Gibbons versus Ogden. On the one hand, some of the stuff in his opinion is pretty awful, but on the other hand, we gotta be honest, he was really taken out of context to support the power of the largest government in the history of the world today. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the episodes, all the archives. On individual episodes, episodes like today's, I've got a bunch of links and references for you to be able to click through and read and learn more on your own time. I also have all the platforms are on both video and audio, and I wanna thank everyone who's been leaving us reviews on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms. That helps us out a great deal. You can also find our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month, and we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. That show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here. Whether it's your first day or you've been here for every episode since day one, I couldn't be more grateful. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this done in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I wanna first start out by mentioning or pointing out, and I will link to this in the show notes, the episode that I mentioned right in the opening, four cases that expanded the Commerce Clause. I covered three cases, this was in July of, uh, of this summer, I covered three cases from the New Deal era, and then another one in 2005 that cemented those views. Adding my own take. This was uh, primarily covering an article by Bob Fiedler. We've got another one of his today on this Gibbons case. Now, we can talk all day about the problems with Wickard versus Filburn. We can do that all day long. And in fact, here's Justice Jackson in that case, Wickard versus Filburn, writing for the majority. Here's the opinion. And he says, this is maybe in section two, at the beginning, Chief Justice Marshall described the federal commerce power with a breath never yet exceeded. That was Gibbons versus Ogden. He literally is talking about this case in 1824 and not saying that they just made up this new expansive view of the Commerce Clause out of thin air or some recent cases throughout the late 1930s, for example, but it came all the way back to the great Chief Justice, 1824, and even the original legal meaning of the Constitution. And here Jackson goes on, he says, he made emphatic the embracing and penetrating nature of this power by warning that effective restraints on its exercise must proceed from political rather than judicial processes. In other words, they were taking the position that uh, unless Congress decides that it wants to limit itself, the court isn't gonna do anything. It has, this has to be a political decision, almost unlimited power. So to get an understanding of what's going on, let's go to Bob Fiedler's article, his latest. This was specifically how one landmark case shaped the Commerce Clause. We published this on November 2nd of this year. And New York law, he writes, gave Aaron Ogden a monopoly. Only his company could operate steamboats within New York waters. Another man, Thomas Gibbons, disregarded that law. He operated steamboats that travel from New Jersey to New York. And in principle, I actually like that dude for saying, well, government granted monopoly, that's horrible. But they're making a different case here. Ogden sued to halt Gibbons's steamboat business. Gibbons countered that New York law, and this is again from Bob's article, New York law interfered with a federal law that licensed him to operate his ships. If Congress had the power to license ships that travel between one state and another, then the New York law would be preempted and thus unconstitutional. Now, the New York courts actually agreed with Ogden and then Gibbons appealed it and took it all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. 
And Bob writes that Ogden argued in the Supreme Court that the New York monopoly law was constitutional under the federal constitution because Congress lacked the power to regulate boats traveling between New York and New Jersey. Now, it may have been a bad law on a state level. I don't think Ogden thought so. But it may have been bad for liberty or bad under the state constitution, but Ogden was making the case, or his lawyers were making the case, that the federal government, Congress, did not have this power under the Commerce Clause. Commerce, he contended, was limited to, quote, traffic, to buying and selling, or the interchange of commodities, and it did not comprehend navigation. Therefore, the argument went, New York law should control. And here from the Constitution Center, they cover Gibbons' view. At the court, they write, Gibbons pointed to the fact that he obtained a license from the federal government to conduct his steamboat business between ports in New York and New Jersey in accordance with the, with the Federal Coasting Act of 1793. No one's making the case that licensing is a problem in the first place and shouldn't exist. This, this is what creates all these conflicts. But anyways, he argued that the monopoly maintained by New York law and the injunction granted by the New York court seem to conflict with this act of Congress and should be struck down in accordance with the supremacy clause. Now, we know that Ogden lost, Gibbons won, but this is where I think it gets interesting and maybe even get a little bit more interesting later. Here's uh, Kurt Lash from, uh, I think this was William & Mary Law Review article back in 2006. And he writes, in striking down the state monopoly, Chief Justice Marshall declined to address either the ninth or the 10th Amendment. Now that's interesting because Thomas Emmett, Thomas A. Emmett, who is Ogden's prime lawyer, this was a main line of argument for the case and it was just totally ignored. Now, it, they could have actually rejected it or set, explained it, but they just acted as if it didn't even exist. They were using St. George Tucker's view, a strict construction of federal power under the 9th and 10th Amendment. Now, Marshall Lash writes also rejected that the argument that Congress lacked the power to grant Gibbons a coasting license. So there was some thought about, like, do they even have the authority to ha give a license? And went on to rule that the state monopoly was in direct conflict with the federal license and therefore invalid under the supremacy clause. That's it. That's what they were talking about. Marshall Lash writes, announced that Congress's power to regulate commerce, and this is where it gets really juicy, is, quote, complete in itself, may be exercised to its utmost extent and acknowledges no limitations other than those prescribed in the Constitution. Now, but as Randy Barnett pointed out, and this was his, his great law review article, uh, The Original Meaning of the Commerce Clause back in 2001. Uh, this was in the section, Judicial Interpretations of Commerce from 1824 to 1935. You should read this whole thing. It's so good. But Barnett puts it this way, 35 years after ratification in the 1824 case of Gibbons versus Ogden, John Marshall was called upon to decide whether navigation was included in the power of Congress to regulate commerce among the states. That was really all the case was about. What did the word commerce or among or commerce regulation of commerce among the several states include navigation. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of the original legal meaning of commerce and the Commerce Clause. You can read Barnett on that, Nadelson, and many others who've written a lot of great stuff. But Barnett, actually, before getting to this point, he gave a lot of background. And he put it this way. He said he held that it was. And from the perspective of original intent, this holding is unremarkable. The above sources, which are cited in his law review paper and others unmentioned, make clear the intention to subject shipping and navigation to the regulation of Congress. So that was most people who look at the original legal meaning of the Commerce Clause also said that it included navigation. So on that point... He's saying, Barnett is saying, oh, okay, he's correct, but he's not alone. Here's Nadelson, who did a lot of work with Barnett on researching those original legal, the word commerce, how it was used in thousands and thousands of applications during the ratification era. And Nadelson puts it this way, the primary holding of Givens was that navigation was within the prevailing legal definition of commerce for constitutional purposes, a decision that under the, the original understanding of the Constitution was clearly correct. So Nadelson's also saying, look, OK, just for that narrow thing, it's totally right. 
Now he points out, though, that some of the court's dicta, this is the extra language. I've talked about this in previous episodes about the Supreme Court, but not in detail. But a lot of times in these opinions, they're going to have all kinds of uh, political views, just other statements. Dicta added that in some circumstances, commerce, including navigation within state boundaries, might be so tied up with interstate commerce that Congress could regulate it as well. Now, dicta, this is uh, from, man, from the University of North Carolina, one of their <laughs> law pages here, but they put it this way. Statements in an opinion, that it's a court opinion, that fall outside of what was necessary to decide the issue at hand are deemed dicta, and they are not considered binding precedent in future cases. But we've often seen federal courts heavily, probably more as much on the state level as well, but I'm more aware of what's happening in the federal courts. They'll look at dicta and when it gives them a foot in the door, they'll cite that as the precedent that they need to expand power in a future case. So that's what uh, that's what Marshall's view on potentially maybe having some also type of regulatory power in the states. He wasn't doing anything specific for that specific case. He was just adding a political opinion. Maybe he knew what he was doing, setting the foundation for the future. Nadelson, again, he says, Gibbons versus Ogden is often appealed to as Justice Jackson did, that was in Wickard versus Filburn, for a very broad reading of the commerce component of the Necessary and Proper Clause. Under this reading, the Necessary and Proper Clause allows Congress to regulate any ec economic activity substantially affecting interstate commerce, not just the commercial activity itself, not just the trade and the associated transportation or navigation to conduct that trade, but anything that has substantial effect on that commerce, including agriculture, mining, manufacture, healthcare, insurance, medical marijuana, and Nadelson writes, in fact, the entire economy. However, and this is very interesting to me, Gibbons did not even mention the necessary and proper clause. I'm gonna have to take his word for it. I mean, I guess I could do a command F and take a look, but uh, I didn't see it either. It didn't even mention necessary and proper, but it's used in a necessary and proper fashion. And back to uh, Bob Fiedler's article, he says, Madison, Marshall adopted a broader interpretation of the meaning of the word commerce. He concluded that commerce, quote, undoubtedly is traffic, but it is something more. It is intercourse. It describes the commercial intercourse between nations and parts of nations in all its branches and is regulated by prescribing rules for that intercourse. Bob goes on, he says, next, Marshall explained that the word among in the Commerce Clause is defined as intermingled with. And you'll see how these types of, and he gives a great analogy of how these definitions can just be used to expand things. Marshall wrote that comprehensive as the word among is, it may very properly be restricted to that commerce which concerns more states than one. The word concerns is another broadening term, he says. But this is how they do it. When the words, and this is again to Fiedler's article, and I love this, this paragraph, good job on this. When the words of the Commerce Clause in the Constitution are replaced by synonyms used by Marshall, commerce with intercourse, among with intermingled with, the power seems to be broader than we originally were given, or so later courts would rule. And that's how they get it done. And back to Constitution Center, check this out. In a separate concurring opinion, Justice Johnson advocated for a more expansive, an even more expansive reading of the Commerce Clause. In a foreshadowing of future debates, he rejected a strict or literal approach to the text of the Constitution, basically rejected the Ninth and Tenth Amendment approach to the Constitution as if they didn't exist. Furthermore, he suggested that the Commerce Clause should be interpreted expansively to ensure, what's this? The advancement of society. That's his view of it, and I'm certain some people have used that since then. And here's how Nadelson summed it up. I've only got a screenshot or a PDF of this article that he wrote in 2011. He points out that Marshall did not say that Congress could govern other aspects of the economy. He's specifically talking about the navigation in the case there. Now, he said maybe it'll come up some other areas in his dicta, but in his opinion, he did not say that Congress could govern other aspects of the, of the economy. And Nadelson says, on the contrary, he listed various regulations reserved exclusively for the states, including, quote, 
health laws of every description. So people will cite this case to claim that the federal government has power over health laws, even though in the case itself, he's saying, no, the federal government does not have this power. This is reserved to the states. And Nadelson's summary here is the best. He says, those who use the Gibbons decision to argue that Congress may supervise the entire American economy are twisting some of Marshall's words and omitting others. And of course, that makes me think of the great John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution in letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania in 1767 and 1768, he put it this way, all artful rulers who strive to extend their power beyond its just limits, endeavor to give to their attempts as much semblance of legality as possible. And one more before heading out, here's John Williams in the New York ratifying convention. He said, ingenious men may, ins may as <laughs> I'll try it again. Ingenious men may assign ingenious reasons for opposite constructions of the same clause. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope it was interesting and more important than anything, I hope you learned something. I can't thank you enough for being here. If you want to help us out, you can do a few free and easy things to help us spread the word. All the platforms, the mainstream ones, the algorithms are pretty easily triggered. So let's trigger them. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podbean or any other podcast platform, YouTube, Facebook, and elsewhere. Smash the like button, leave a comment, share links. That helps a great deal. Subscribe and get notifications. The more you do that, the more the platforms will show the program to more people. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, do not feel obligated, but please consider it. I will be very grateful for that. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members is where you go. And it starts out as little as two bucks a month. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you have a great weekend. And I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.